humanitarian impact of a full-scale ground invasion um, in Rafah. Okay. Um, and then, uh, secondly, uh, I presume that you've seen some of the images, video, and still photos, plus witness accounts, and written witness accounts of what happened at the Shifa Hospital. Do you have anything to say about about that? Yeah, so I have seen uh, a, a few things. One, the accounts in the media from inside Gaza, and I, of course, have seen what the IDF has said about the operations that it has conducted, where it has said it has uh, killed a number of me uh, members of Hamas and detained, I think, several hundred additional members of Hamas. Um, we, as often is the case, don't have anyone uh, the ability to get full ground truth because we don't have anyone on the, on the ground uh, in Gaza. Uh, I will say from our perspective, the, the things you have heard us say before, of course, remain true, which is we generally don't want to see Israel operating inside hospitals in Gaza. We want to see hospitals be protected sites. Uh, but it is concerning that after Israel had conducted an operation earlier in this campaign to clear al-Shifa, that al-Shifa again was apparently infiltrated by Hamas fighters. And so two things about that. One, look, obviously we, um, uh, it would be great if Hamas would stop hiding behind civilians and stop uh, hiding inside civilian infrastructure, including hospitals, but two, it points out what we have been saying all along, which is the need for Israel to have a sustainable long-term strategy when it comes to Gaza, uh, that it's not enough to just clear certain neighborhoods or hospitals or any other uh, <coughs> geographic areas or buildings of, of Hamas. They need to have a long-term sustainable strategy that is not just a security strategy, but also a political strategy if they really want to uh, secure the future of Israel against the terrorist threat that has so to date emanated from Gaza. Right. So you don't have any any comment on w what you've seen from the aftermath of the two week operation against the hospital. Not beyond what I just said. Right. And then when you just say, and this will be it for me, um, when you say um, Israel needs a sustainable long term strategy uh, for Gaza. Have you seen one yet from them? Uh, we have not yet seen one, no. And that's what we have been in conversation with them about. Yeah, that, but that presumably they, the meeting today is just about <clears throat> Rafa, right? It's, it's just not, about it's just right. about Rafa. And the and the point I mean, a sustainable long term strategy means something beyond a military strategy. It, be, it means yeah, uh, but, but, a, a political path as well. Right. So a political path to two states. That that, right. that is that is from our preferred that is our preferred policy. But it, you need a political path. Yeah. Uh, of but have you seen? Forward. But no. have you? But no. have you seen one from the Israelis that is even that is even short of at, two at, states? At this point, we have not known. All right. Thank you. Go. Uh, just to follow up on El Shifa, um, Israel has given some numbers: two hundred militants uh, have been killed, nine hundred suspected militants detained, of whom some five hundred have been identified as Hamas. Does the United States have any assessment that these numbers are correct? We don't have an independent assessment. No. Do you have an assessment on how many civilians around that operation have been killed? We do not. Okay. Um, moving on to this strike, this suspected Israeli strike in Damascus, do you have anything to say on this? I don't. States? Obviously, it just happened in the, the hour or two before I came out here. We are in conversations with partners in the region, gathering more uh, information, but uh, at this point don't have uh, confirmation either of the target or the responsible party. Do you know if the United States was given a heads up by Israel about this? Uh, again, we are gathering information. I don't have anything uh, about the strike right now. I don't have anything beyond that to offer. Okay. Do you have any concerns that this might sort of escalate tensions, which are already high? <laughs> so. And I in a way, endanger yeah. the hostage talk so in any way? So I don't want to, before we have gathered information about what exactly this was, I don't want to speak to it uh, specifically. But of course, we are always uh, concerned about um, uh, about anything that would be escalatory or um, cause an increase in conflict in the region. It has been one of the goals of this administration since October 7th to keep the conflict from spreading, recognizing that Israel has a, uh, the right to defend itself from adversaries that are sworn to its destruction. Um, but with respect to the hostage talks, there's no reason why this incident should have any impact on, on the hostage talks. Uh, we have long believed it is uh, in the interest uh, of everyone to see these hostage talks succeed because 
you would not just see um, uh, a re relief to the civilian population in Gaza that desperately needs it. Uh, it would enable the increase in humanitarian assistance into Gaza, and of course, it would get the hostages out. So, no, I, I don't know. I don't believe it should have any impact on that. Can you say how those talks are going? Entirely. I don't have any new assessment to, to offer today. Okay, two final things. This is about last, uh, this is from last week about these um, authorizations of uh, these bombs to, to Israel. They have been approved a long time ago by Congress, but looks like the State <coughs> Department has decided to uh, do the transfers <coughs> last week, the week before. Um, why was that decision taken, like, recently? So, let me, I think it would be helpful to step back and put this in a little context. Um, and the context is that we, the United States has a decades-long commitment to Israel's for security. Uh, Israel is surrounded by entities that are sworn to its destruction, not just Hamas, but Iran, uh, and proxy groups that Iran sponsors, uh, Hezbollah among them, who have repeatedly talked about their desire for the destruction of Israel. We believe Israel has every right to defend itself against those opponents, um, and we to that end, have a long-standing security relationship with them where we provide them more than $3 billion annually in security assistance. Now, the way that that works, um, and I know you preface this in, in, in your question, but just for, for the benefit of everyone else, the way that that works is we provide them with $3.3 .3 billion a year in uh, security assistance. They don't always draw all of that down in any given year, but they uh, come to the United States, request certain defense articles. Um, we make assessments about whether those are appropriate or not. We notify them to Congress in the regular course of business. And oftentimes what happens, let's say, uh, just as an example, this is a fictional example, let's say they requested 100 planes. Uh, we make a decision, we notify Congress. That doesn't mean that they take 100 planes tomorrow once that notification has been given and once the approval has been given. They draw those down over time, and sometimes it takes years to fulfill those requests. And so those are, those are the types of things that I see you wanting to, to go. Uh, bear, bear with me. I know, I, I know this is long, and then you'll have the opportunity for follow-up. Um, those are the types of things that often take years to fulfill, and they were happening before October 7th, and they have continued after October 7th. So what these, about are, are, these are about, uh, in many cases, are about self-defense, but also deterrence and replenishment. And so we make these in the regular course of business. And what I can tell you about them is that we follow the same procedures uh, with respect to everyone that we do for every other country in the world, which is that we notify Congress. And in fact, since October 7th, we have gone above and beyond to notify Congress about uh, these transfers. So there is a statutory threshold where we are required to, to um, notify them of transfers. We have been regularly briefing the committees to, let, to, to make them aware of every transfer that, that we are making. So I'm going to have to combine my questions now that you've taken up so much time to answer. I understand. I would apologize, but I don't oh, think you'd believe no, it. I'm just joking. First, take your time. I understand the fulfillment can take years, but are you basically saying that the authorization <clears throat> of the transfer coming in these recent weeks was a coincidence? Uh, so I, I'm not saying it's a coincidence. The Israel has been engaged in a military conflict, and of course, when you are engaged in a military conflict, you deplete your military stocks. So there was a request and, and you in recent those, weeks those, I'm not for, gonna, the, for the additional uh, fulfill, uh, for the fulfillment so of these particular into, I'm not get, weapons. As is always the case, I'm not getting into the timings of, ex, of exact requests from okay, here. My final, well, let me just, let me just, I'll be quick. It's a, but this is a process that we keep Congress fully apprised okay. of, our, our relevant committees. Oh. Um, but, but when you see these types of requests and when they get publicly reported, you have to remember that Israel is in an armed conflict and is, is um, uh, expending a great deal of defense material, and some of that needs to be replenished for Israel's long-term security. Right. And my final thing on this is, like, Secretary and a lot of senior officials from this administration basically said far too many Palestinians have been killed. But when you go and make the – and we know that the administration's policy hasn't changed. It is not conditioning weapons to Israel. But when you go and make such an authorization of the transfer in recent weeks, even if the <clears throat> actual weapons transfer has been approved years ago, don't you think that is going to damage the weight of your word, the, your credibility, and basically your, your sincerity in saying that? So I, I do not agree with that at all. We have been very clear that we want to see Israel do everything it can to minimize civilian casualties. We have uh, made clear that they need to do every that they need to operate at all times in full compliance with international humanitarian law. 
At the same time, we are committed to Israel's right to self-defense, and this is a long-term commitment the United States has made, that it made before October 7th, and that continues, uh, uh, in, <coughs> it continues since October 7th. So it, obviously the fight in Gaza is connected to Israel's long-term security in very substantial ways. I got into some of that with, with response to Matt's question. Uh, but Israel still faces, <coughs> uh, on, in addition to the security challenge posed with, in Gaza, it still faces an Iran that is hostile to Israel. It still faces Hezbollah on its northern border that is hostile to Israel and says it is committed to the destruction of Israel. And so we are going to continue to support Israel's ability to defend itself against those sworn enemies that want to see it, it end as a modern state or a state at all. Yeah. Hey, just to follow up, a 2,000 pound bomb is, is self-defense in, in your opinion? It is, it is a, um, uh, so they need to have the ability to defend themselves against a very well-armed adversary. Like I said, Iran, Hezbollah, which has thousands and thousands of fighters and quite sophisticated uh, material and quite sophisticated weaponry as we've seen them deploy, <coughs> excuse me, against Israel in the last few days. So yes, they do need the, the, the modern military equipment to defend yeah, themselves against these adversaries. In Gaza, or in the beginning in Gaza. And we have made clear to them that, when, that whatever, um, whatever weapon they use in Gaza, be it a bomb, be it a tank round, be it anything, that we expect them to use those weapons in full compliance with international humanitarian law. And we've said, we have had very frank conversations with them about the fact that there, far too many civilians have died through their operations and that they need to do better in taking into account uh, the need to minimize civilian harm, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, just uh, on that point, um, okay, took the requests were done years ago, what have you, but this time around, you were <clears throat> suspiciously very careful not to publicize it. Um, usually, you do the notifications to Congress, you, you do a you know, statement, what have you. Uh, but this time, I understand you didn't need to do it because we, it was so passed, but I just say we did notify Congress. No, we, no, we I did, know. We but followed, you didn't we followed, publicize it. So it is Usually not. you do on, on arms sales and all that, you, you, so, you publicize it. So that's not true with respect to most arms sales around the world. I know people have gotten used to our, um, uh, the tempo of arms sales with respect to Ukraine, but that is very, a very different situation than our arms sales to Israel or any other country with which we have a security relationship because we stood it up from nowhere right before an active war where most of our security relationships, we don't publicize uh, our ongoing sales. What we do is we notify Congress about those sales and we have done that with respect to these sales to, to Israel um, as we do with respect to sales anywhere in the world. Okay. Just a last question on the, back on Damas. Uh, okay, I understand it's, it's a bit early, but uh, obviously you don't deny there was a strike. Uh, by Israel on the consulate in the annex in, in the, the embassy of Iran in Damascus. So we've seen the strike, but again, I want to uh, I want to let the cons consultations that we have ongoing with partners in the region take place uh, but if we, if we, before we can before I can comment uh, yeah, any further. But it's definitely escalatory. That's not what I said either. I said no. I'm I said, saying that. Uh, you're saying that great. Uh, I thought it was a question. I'm asking for your reaction. Uh, so Humera kind of, kind of, that's that's good. Humera kind of did speak to this. Um, I'm not going to comment with respect to this particular strike um, because, again, we just need to know more information about it before we do, and that includes drawing any conclusions from it. As a general principle, of course, we are worried about escalation. We are do, worried about anything that would cause the conflict to to expand or widen in any way. I have one on Havana, a couple, unless no, you want let more me, about let me, come back, let me come back to you so the room doesn't go into an uproar. Saeed, uh, I will definitely thank come Thank you. Back. Thank you, Matt. Now, you said that Hamas returned to a Shifa hospital. There were some 800 fighters mm -hmm. and so on and all these things. Now, is that you are... You are citing the Israeli narrative, or you have your own independent information? We don't have our own independent assessment, right. but you have seen Israel produce the names, uh, uh, the names, Right. And photographs of known Hamas fighters right. who it has killed or how, captured. How, how many? I mean, you know, they showed names and Hamas fighters in the Shifa Hospital. I, ha I have seen yeah. the information they have publicly released. Right. I, but, but, well, but, but, I just let, I know you get. Let me just. No, 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 I'm, no, with no, you. Me, I'm not. I'm not just, interrupting. I'm trying to understand what good. you're saying. So we have seen them release. I, the, I, I don't think. Uh, there's anyone who has cause to dispute that. Right. Yes, they have. Right. Uh, there were. There were right. uh, Hamas fighters hiding in Al Shifa right. Hospital again right. not for the first right. time okay so you are certain that the reason that Israel went into Hamas into a Shifa Hospital one more time is because Hamas fighters were there and not 
you know, hundreds of civilians that have taken refuge there. So I think it is a, uh, certainly a fair conclusion, right. given what has been their goal since right. the outset of this right. campaign, to take the fight to Hamas. Right. Uh, that is exactly what they were doing. And you yes. believe that Israel has achieved that goal now by eliminating Hamas, or are we likely to see them go back to a Shiba hospital again? So that is, I, I answered that question somewhat in, in response to Matt. I think right. there is a concern that you right. saw Hamas back inside hospitals. Right. I don't know why I don't hear more people calling on Hamas to stop going into hospitals. You shouldn't have to clear Hamas from a hospital right. once, okay. let alone twice. Right. Um, but yes, we do have the, the, the concern that uh, Hamas has been able to reestablish right. itself in a hospital uh, that Israel had already cleared, and that p points to an ongoing challenge for Israel right. in the way it conducts its operations. Right. Uh, yeah, just bear with me C a couple more uh, questions. You know, so, but why do you think, in your opinion, what value is there strategically for Israel to burn all the buildings, destroy all the equipment, destroy every last X-ray machine and everything in the hospital and not keep it? You know, if their so, fight is with the fighters, why must you destroy as they left? There were, you know, there was no fighting when they left just to, to burn the buildings and burn the things and destroy everything. So let me just say... Why is, that, gets, so, why is that okay? Let me just say this gets into where uh, right. I'm often asked to comment on, on to questions where there are conflicting accounts. Right. And Israel has said that is not what they did, and we right. don't have ground truth okay. uh, on, on that question. Israel has said what they tried to do is protect patients and not operate right. in places when there are patients, to evacuate people from the hospital, right. and only operate in a way... Um, that would impact the Hamas fighters that were there. Obviously, it's an incredibly difficult situation. There shouldn't be terrorists in a hospital at all. Mm -hmm. And so it's incredibly difficult to operate there and, and uh, achieve a legitimate right. counterterrorism goal in a way that minimizes harm to, the, right. to patients, which goes back to the, my first point, which is Hamas shouldn't be in a hospital at all. Okay. Well, Hamas shouldn't be, as far as you know, Israel and the United States is concerned, should not be there, period. But I would uh, think, Saeed, uh, everyone could conclude. I, I would think, including you, I would think everyone could conclude that Hamas should not be inside well, of I don't think, no, well, I, I don't think, I hope anyway that that's not a controversial opinion. Well, okay, but that's that's a different issue altogether. Now, not, really. Me, okay, not really. Not really, no, it's kind of the core of what we're talking well, about. Okay. Uh, uh, let me ask you something. You, you, you talked about the 2,000 pound bombs. Uh, and so on. You think that it is really wise to send it at this time? You know, when this far in this battle, you know, or this war, it has only been used in Gaza. I mean, I know you say that uh, Israel is surrounded by, uh, you know, people that wish it would and so on. But in fact, it's surrounded by Egypt with very good relations with Israel, surrounded by Jordan with good relations with Israel, surrounded by Syria that is obviously embroiled in its own civil war and cannot even defend itself against attacks as we have seen today. So quite the contrary, is Israel is surrounding Hamas and it's using these weapons to do that. And in fact, I mean, you know, the F-35, to the best of my knowledge, I could be wrong, has only been used in combat against the people of Gaza. So how could you justify sending all these weapons when you have the most hapless people probably on earth, you know, destroyed, moving from one place to another, and so on, and you send these weapons to sort of just finish the job or continue the job? I don't know. So, what logic is there so, in sending those weapons? So the logic is exactly what I outlined a, a moment ago. Despite the fact that Israel has, a relation, has diplomatic relations with Egypt uh, and Jordan, it does not change the fact that Hezbollah is parked on its northern border and is sworn to the destruction of Israel. It does not change the fact uh, that Iran, uh, uh, no, not exactly, not right on its border, but well within striking distance, is committed to the destruction of Israel and continues to fund proxies committed to the destruction of Israel. So yes, Israel faces incredibly ser serious threats, not just from Hamas, although Hamas is clearly one, as we saw on October 7th, but from other adversaries uh, that it needs uh, our assistance uh, to continue to defend itself against. Lastly, lastly, uh, please, just one, one, one last one, if I may. Uh, are you aware of a report made or a, a conversation that Israeli officers made with, to, or an interview with Haaretz where they say that Israel established some sort of an illusionary, you know, kill zone uh, line and so on? Are you aware of that? I and they actually kill whoever mm. walks or moves about in that area? I, I read that article and I noted that in it the IDF says that that, that of course is not what they have established. There are, of course, 
areas of significant combat where uh, any civilian could wander in and be the, the um, uh, unfortunately be killed either by fire from Israel or by fire from Hamas. If you walk into an active conflict zone, uh, that's a possibility. I've, but I have noted that the IDF said they have not, of course, established kill zones. It would be incredibly in inappropriate for anything uh, like that to be established, and we've not seen evidence at this point that they have. Go ahead, I'll come okay. to you next. Uh, there, there's reporting that Israel submitted a plan to the UN that would essentially dismantle UNRWA, uh, transferring staff and funds to World Food and some other organizations. Have you seen that plan? Do you support it? Uh, I have not seen that plan. I can't speak to whether somebody inside the United States government has. We continue to support the work that UNRWA does, uh, both in Gaza and uh, uh, in the broader region. We think that they play a critical role in delivering humanitarian assistance to people who, who need it. Now, the United States cannot fund UNRWA by statute now, given the recent action by Congress, so we are exploring ways that we can direct the humanitarian assistance. We are committed to providing the Palestinian people through other organizations, uh, and we look forward to identifying ways to do that and continuing to support humanitarian assistance to Palestinian civilians. Um, but that does not mean that, that um, we do not also support UNRWA's work. We want to see it continue. Uh, Matt, is today the Knesset passed a law, 70 to 10, voting to <clears throat> pave the way for the closure of all Al Jazeera offices inside Israel. I'm just wondering if you have a comment on that. So we support the independent free press anywhere in the world. And we think the work that the independent free press does is important everywhere in the world. And it, much of what we know about what has happened in Gaza is because of reporters who are there doing their jobs, including reporters from Al Jazeera. Um, I'll say, we're just with, with respect to Al Jazeera, obviously, we, you know, I think it's well known that we've not always agreed with all of Al Jazeera's coverage, but it's a media organization that we engage with. I've done interviews with Al Jazeera. Other people from the department have done uh, interviews with Al Jazeera. So um, what we will continue to make clear is that we support the work that the free press does. Our assessment with that uh, uh, passage of this law and previous incidents with, to our crew in Gaza that uh, this like, enhanced our suspicion from the beginning that our crews were actually targeted, not by mistake or by... Do you, does this trouble you that a media organization just becomes the target of, of, the, of the Israel and become part of the targets in this war? So with respect to targeting, I mean targeting in a sense, not, not through a law passed by the Knesset, but I think with respect to potential military targeting, uh, Israel has said very clearly that that's not what they have done. Uh, obviously, that would be incredibly inappropriate. Uh, you've heard the Secretary speak to this, that it, it is tragic how many journalists have lost their life uh, in this war. Um, because as I just spoke to a minute ago, they go, they put their own lives at risk in bringing us information about what's happening inside Gaza. And it's important that we continue to get that information. And so we support the work that journalists do in Gaza. We support the work that they do around the world. Tom, go ahead. Just to go back to the meeting between US and Israeli officials, why is this happening virtually? Uh, I will leave it to the White House, which is the primary. The White House took the lead in organizing this meeting, so I'll le leave it to them. But I mean, there's an important diplomatic element because we know, I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu said in press conference yesterday that he pulled the delegation traveling to send a message because of the UN Security Council vote. So it will worry people that on such an important issue, and it's not a long flight from Tel Aviv, that this meeting is not happening in person. I mean, what does that say about your ability to persuade the Israelis on the issue of an invasion of Rafa when you haven't been able to persuade them even to fly to Washington? So I'm in a little bit of a box here because I can't talk about the outcome of the meeting because it's still, <laughs> maybe it's broken now since I've been at the, the podium. Um, we will have more to say about the meeting later today, but uh, I'll just say I would not expect this to be our final engagement on this issue. Do you think you can persuade them? I mean, this so far this doesn't feel like, you know, a huge success of your argument because you've been saying for weeks uh, you don't support a ground invasion of Rafa. The Israeli Prime Minister has been saying for weeks they will go in. So we will continue to make what we believe is the best case to Israel about actions that it should take in Rafa that won't just minimize civilian harm and 
prevent an unnecessary loss of life in a place where you have, have somewhere around 1.4 million uh, civilians living today, but also would be in Israel's long-term security interests. And I think that's an important point that we don't, the, the case that we are making to Rafa is not just about the interests of the Palestinian people, it's also about Israel's long-term security interests. And you heard the, the Secretary speak to this a, a, uh, some in Tel Aviv, when I know you were, you were there. Uh, about the toll that this has taken on, this campaign has taken on Israel's standing in the world and its uh, uh, ability to influence countries around the world. And we think that a full scale of an invasion of Rafa would only uh, further that impact to Israel's standing. So we're going to make that case to them. Ultimately, they're a sovereign country and will make their own decisions. Um, but we're going to make the, the we will uh, lay out to them the way we see it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and will this conversation also make clear what the U.S. will do if they go ahead with a full-scale invasion uh, in response, or is this just laying out alternatives? Uh, so two things about that. One, with respect to the broader question not tied directly to this meeting, I've gotten that before, and I'm just not going to speak to hypotheticals. We're going to take it one step at a time and not make uh, any predictions about what will happen. I'm just happen. asking if that's being discussed uh, in this meeting. Yeah, but what will happen. And then with respect to the meeting itself, again, I'm not going to speak in detail about a meeting that was still ongoing when I walked out here. We'll have more to say but about it. But you have it. spoken. We'll have more to say about it what, once it's concluded. So at, a, at a very high level, not, not in OK. Detail. And just one more question yeah. on Israel. Um, I understand the regular course of business when it comes to arms sales, of course, Israel, any other country. Um, but I'm just trying to understand if if you're saying that you know these weapons were promised, they were approved, the process went through, and now they're going forward, is that regular process um, being um, examined at all, uh, given what's going on in the Israel-Hamas war, or not at all? So that process is a process that applies not just to Israel, but to every country that uh, with whom we have a security relationship. So it is one that is longstanding. Um, and again, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of open orders uh, for Israel that go back years uh, under which they uh, receive defense articles from the United States. So no, that is not a, it is not a new process, uh, and it's not one just with respect to, to Israel. And, and no, we're not re-examining the entire process, but obviously we always look at, we always look at requests that come from any country um, in light of their current needs and in light of um, uh, our ability to supply them. But again, I think it's important to remember that these are requests that were made and approved in many cases years ago not just months ago, not just before uh, 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 October 7th, but years ago, and were approved years ago. So all of those orders that have been approved will go forward? Uh, so I can't say all of them will go forward because Israel may come back and not want some of them. You talk about orders if that are If Israel years, wants them, year, they'll go forward. That years old. I cannot speak with respect to every request. And as I said, there are dozens of open requests that date back years, but when uh, a country comes and makes a request and the United States does its due di diligence and goes through the formal process of notifying Congress uh, and then uh, uh, de uh, delivers those arms to a country. If a, Cong if a country has ordered, like I said, 100 planes and they've taken 20, they still have the ability to come back and ask for the other 80 with which we've committed to provide them. Uh, on Israel? Else on Israel, on Israel? Let me, let me I'll go ahead, Gita, and then I'll come to Himera next. Um, Thank you. Uh, you referenced Iran a couple of times just during the past 10, 15 minutes. Um, it seems like the, their um, proxy groups in Iraq have attacked, uh, conducted an attack against Iliad in Israel. So despite everything that the U.S. is trying to do to contain the war to just the Gaza Strip, it's, Iran is doing the opposite. Now, what options are you, could there be besides, you know, uh, diplomatic options that are really not going anywhere. So two things on that. One, we have, uh, or I should say one, I think it reinforces the point I was just making about the um, Iranian-supported proxy groups uh, who are committed to the destruction of Israel, not just um, Hezbollah, not just Hamas, but proxy groups that exist in Iraq and did uh, attempt to launch an attack against Israel over the weekend. Uh, but two, we will continue to make clear to uh, 
those groups and to Iran that it is not in their interest to take strikes against Israel, it is not in the interest to take strikes against the United States, as we have done uh, for some time. How much confidence do you have in the Iraqi government to contain them? Because the foreign minister was here, the prime minister is supposed to be coming, and there hasn't the government hasn't really been able to deliver. So I would say that that is an ongoing conversation we have with our Iraqi counterparts about the need to um, take action against proxy groups that uh, launch attacks from uh, within Iraqi, uh, inside Iraq. You have seen, obviously, a dramatic decrease in the number of those attacks over the past month or six weeks, but it is something that we continue to engage with the Iraqi government about. Can I ask Any a question more on about his, uh, Iran? Humera, Humera, and then we'll, we'll come around. Um, just one thing. In your answer, Matt, to me and a few others on, on the weapons thing, you mentioned um, you know, the threat from Hezbollah, like on Israel and all that. So were you trying to suggest that you know, in the course of this latest authorization for the transfer, did you get any assurances from Israel that it's not going to use these, like in its offensive in Gaza, but it's only going to use these against Hezbollah? So, no, that's not what I said at all. I think you're reading quite a bit into. Okay, no, I just want to check that. Reading quite a bit into my answer, but again, the recent authorizations that you're talking about were, in many cases, made years ago. Right. Right. But, years but, ago. But before just to, October 7th. Yes, but just to be sure, there has been no assurances. The United States has not sought any assurances from Israel, just in the wake of this, or just before this, uh, this transfer. Like, you can use it in this place, and you can't use it in that place. So There's I'm been not, no such conversation. I, I, I am that. not going to get into the private conversations we have uh, with any country, in the world, any country in the world. But that is not to read into that. You should not read into that, that we are uh, imposing so, uh, uh, some kind of conditions. The, what we expect with respect to the defense articles that we supply to Israel and other countries are that they operate in compliance with international humanitarian law. Now, with respect to a campaign against Hezbollah or a potential campaign against Hezbollah, we have seen we want to see that issue resolved uh, diplomatically. We want to see um, uh, Israeli citizens able to return to their homes in northern Israel. We want to see uh, Lebanese civilians able to return to their home in southern Lebanon, but that's a, um, uh, that's a path we're pursuing diplomatically. And just b b by law, you had the authority not to make the transfer, right? Like even if Congress had approved this years ago, even if the fulfillment takes years, the United States government certainly had the has the authority not to fulfill so it today. Whether we have right? the authority or not is one question. There are always ramifications. Um, uh, if you have committed to supply a country with something and you don't, this gets very technical. No, I'm just and, wondering and, if you and, had the and, option. And we, but the again, choice. We are committed to the defense of Israel. Yeah. I know people want me to say some kind of different answer, but we are committed to Israel's long-term security. And yeah. again, this is something that predates October 7th and will continue to be the policy of the United States. And we will, and, and we will in, in uh, keeping with that commitment, continue to, to uh, be very direct and candid with Israel about how it is in their interest to use the articles uh, of defense that we provide them, as well as weapons that they manufacture themselves, in full compliance with international humanitarian law and in a way that minimizes civilian harm. Final thing I promise, are you expecting today's talk to feature at all the humanitarian plan that Israel is supposed to present to you? Why don't we just wait? I, I, let's, I think I've probably talked enough about the, the, okay. these ongoing talks. Let's wait for what we'll have to say about them uh, at the conclusion. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. In Lebanon, you've been saying you are trying to resolve uh, the, the issue on the northern borders uh, diplomatically. You've been successful so far, but are you concerned that now it's been escalating for the last two weeks? Are, is the risk higher now? Uh, I don't want to assess a relative level of risk. Our concern about escalation has, is high. It has been high since October 7th. And that is why we have engaged in a diplomatic process to try to resolve uh, the very real security challenges that Israel faces uh, without further conflict and what's, what we're going to continue to, to uh, pursue. One more question. Uh, during the secretary visit to the region, can you confirm the reports that uh, the Arab ministers uh, gave him an Arab proposal on how on the day after and on the establishment of a Palestinian state within three years? So I'm not going to confirm that report, but the path forward for Gaza and the West Bank and the Palestinian people is something that we have been engaged with, with partners in the region. 
Uh, as you may recall, when the Secretary traveled, well, I should back up, it's really been something that we have been engaged with partners since the immediate aftermath of October 7th, but it's a process that intensified when he traveled to the region in early January uh, and started direct coordination with Arab partners about how to rebuild Gaza, uh, establish security inside Gaza, and ultimately provide a political path forward uh, for the Palestinian people. And that's something that we continue to engage with uh, our Palestinian part or, I'm sorry, our um, uh, Arab partners about, but I don't want to get into specifics of those conversations. Thank you. All right, get one more, and then we'll, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take some others. Go ahead. Thank you. One Election. Uh, as you know that this election has been scheduled for June 10th and it's supposed to be further delayed, especially the KDP, the ruling party, is refusing to participate in that election. In the past few days, the U.S. ambassador met the KDP leader twice. So do you have any concern that the election, the carry I election will not happen in the scheduled time? And then how are you going to encourage the KDP and other political parties to overcome the disputes and having election either on June 10th or any other day this year? So we understand the IKR president uh, and various Iraqi authorities and political parties are actively considering next steps. We encourage efforts to schedule free, fair, and credible elections in the IKR. And I realize I forgot to come back to you about, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, we could do, it seems like we could do the whole briefing on it. So let me, we'll, we'll move on for now and then come back um, if there's more time. Go ahead, I, I promise. Um, per the CBS 60 Minutes reporting that aired on Sunday, a first incident of Havana syndrome took place in Frankfurt with an employee of the US consulate. This happened two years before the already known cases that occurred in Havana in 2016. Can you confirm there was an incident in 2014, at least one incident in Frankfurt that led to apparent Havana syndrome symptoms? So we have made it a practice to not confirm or comment on specific reports uh, uh, in this regard. What I will say is what we have done for affected employees, uh, and that is we have implemented the Havana Act passed by Congress that has allowed us to provide additional support to those affected employees, uh, including uh, reimbursement for medical care, including free care at military hospitals and other military treatment facilities. Uh, it includes help uh, with their careers if they've been affected by, say, uh, a prolonged absence from work. Uh, the safety and security of our personnel remains the top priority of the Secretary, and we are doing everything possible to help those uh, affected. A couple more uh, on Havana still. Does the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research have confidence that the, in the U.S. intelligence community's assessment that it is unlikely that a foreign adversary is causing Havana syndrome? So we do. It has been the broad uh, uh, conclusion of the intelligence community since March 20, uh, 2023 that it's unlikely a foreign adversary is responsible for these anomalous health incidents. It's something that the uh, intelligence community has investigated extensively and continues to look at. Um, we will look at the uh, new information as it comes in and make assessments inside the State Department and with our intelligence community. But you can't confirm whether whether INR agrees with that in this building? No, I said we do. They, they do, do share that. You do? Okay. Share that um, and uh, I don't know if you've seen the report uh, that aired on Sunday, but will any State Department employees who believe they are victims of Havana face consequences for publicly questioning the intel community's assessment? No, of course not. Okay. Janie, go ahead. And let me, let me, uh, I said, let me just come back and say, um, uh, uh, of course not, and in no case um, uh, would we in any way hold employees, uh, accountable is not even the right word, in no case would we uh, discipline employees for speaking their mind. They have the uh, ability to do, to do that. We encourage it. But that doesn't change our assessment. Um, uh, and I say the, I should say our, the intelligence community's broad assessment that a foreign adversary is, is unlikely to be responsible for these incidents. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Russia and North Korea and China. Uh, Russia opposes extending the term of UN Security Council's panel of experts on sanctions against North Korea. How concerned is the United States about this? Uh, incredibly concerned. I spoke to this at, at detail, in detail last week. It's unfortunate that uh, Russia and China decided to exercise their veto. This is a panel that has previous, whose work has previously been extended unanimously. And uh, I think it's clear what happened here is that Russia made a bargain with the DPRK in return for uh, 
the DPRK army did in its war against Ukraine, and now we're seeing Russia deliver on its end of the bargain. So uh, how will violations of North Korea's nuclear and the missile test be sanctioned in the future? So we still have a full range of uh, sanctions uh, uh, on North Korea, and we will continue to enforce those. On uh, China, uh, President Xi Jinping and uh, Russian President Putin will hold a summit meeting in China next month. What do you think about the solidarity between Russia and China? So we have made clear that we have concerns um, with the full-scale partnership. I'm going to get the words exactly wrong that we have seen between Russia and China. We have made um, uh, very clear that we don't want to see China do anything to help support Russia's aggression in Ukraine, and we will continue to make that clear. Thank you. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Thank you, Mike. Two separate topics. Let me start with the latest extension. RFPRA reporter, also from Russia, pre-trial detention today. Um, what is your reaction to the court decision? And with the American embassy officials being present for the first time, what can you tell us about her condition? So we are deeply concerned about the about her detention in Russia. We condemn in the strongest possible terms the Kremlin's continued attempts to intimidate, repress, and punish journalists and civil society voices. Uh, the charges against uh, Ms. Kumasheva are just another sign of the weakness of Putin's regime. And with respect to uh, her condition, I would refer you to the embassy officials who were there at her hearing. She happened to speak about that, you know, from the court hearing. She said it's a poor condition. She doesn't feel very well. There's no minimum you know, conditions for her. Um, I know you're in the middle of fact gathering when it comes to you know, designating her uh, arrest as, as wrongful. But how much of what we have heard publicly from her today? will help you expedite the process. So we look at a broad range of information when it comes to uh, making those determinations. Some of that information is public, some of it is not public. Some of it is information that's available to the United States government, uh, and we'll continue to collect information in this case as we do in all potential wrongful determinations. Thank you. I'll, thank you. I'll move on to uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Yeah. Over the weekend, we saw the Azeri side was trying to push a narrative that the Armenian side was trying to escalate, you know, um, and something that, you know, EU monitoring mission didn't uh, confirm. Uh, what, how much do you know what's going on, and uh, how concerned are you about potential escalation, and what kind of reaction will that invite if that happens, presumably this week, Daisy? So we saw the statement from uh, the government of Azerbaijan over the weekend. Uh, I would note that the EU monitoring mission uh, said yesterday that the Armenia-Azerbaijan border was calm and quiet, with no unusual military troop or artillery movements, despite those, those statements. We caution, and will continue to caution, against escalating rhetoric or hostilities along the border. We continue to encourage the creation of conditions for a just and dignified peace in the region where the rights of all are respected. And as you've heard me say from this podium many times, the only way to ensure a sustainable peace is at the negotiating table. I know the Secretary has an engagement this week with the Armenian side. Is there anything you're going to do in terms of you know, reaching out to Azeris to prevent the escalation? Uh, so we will continue to make clear to, to um, both Armenia and Azerbaijan that escalation is in no one's interest. I don't have any uh, diplomatic conversations to preview. Have the Azeris been even invited to the meeting that will happen this week? So I think, again, this meeting, remember, is about Armenia's reforms and its democracy, economy, and resilience. Um, the peace process is not the focus of this meeting. It's a meeting between the U.S., EU, and Armenia to discuss economic diversification, humanitarian assistance, uh, support for refugees, and supporting Armenia's political reforms in areas such as democracy and the rule of law. It is not a regionally focused meeting. You can find one for me, if I may, on uh, 60 minutes uh, investigation. The reports about you know, um, that uh, American significant in Tbilisi also uh, you know, talked about them being uh, impacted. How concerned are you about uh, Russian operations in, in the region, in Georgia, of course? Uh, uh, so again, I'm not going to comment on specific reports. As I said, um, uh, we, we make it a practice not to do. But we obviously are concerned with the destabilizing act actions of Russia all around the region. Thank you. Well, welcome, Doctor. Uh, go ahead. Right. Uh, so uh, this is on the meeting between U.S., South Korea, and Japan on Friday um, to counter North Korea's cyber threats. Uh, what are some of the things that came out of that meeting that you is doing to counter these cyber threats, and um, how big of a problem is it for the U.S.? Uh, let me take that back and get you uh, uh, an answer. Uh, thanks, Matthew. Uh, can you confirm that uh, next week an Israeli delegation is going to uh, come to Washington in person? Will Secretary Blinken uh, participate in that? 
Uh, no, I cannot confirm that. As I said, uh, I would not expect that the conversation today will be our last one, um, but I don't have anything else to offer. And regarding um, the likely shuttering of Al Jazeera in Israel, the, what the Israeli government said over the years is that the channel has been known to instigate violence, and it's just, you know, obviously it's a propaganda arm of Qatar. What do you make of those um, pushbacks? Uh, I don't have anything to add to what I said uh, a moment ago, which is obviously we don't, we've made clear we don't agree with everything uh, that Al Jazeera airs, but at the same time, uh, we support the free, independent press anywhere in the world. But it's not independent, Michelle, it's owned by Qatar. Michelle, go ahead. Yeah, uh, are you concerned about the security situation in Jordan, especially that there are reports uh, stating that uh, the regime is under threat from Iran and its proxies? Uh, no, I, uh, we have a close working relationship with the uh, the government of Jordan, and I don't uh, I don't share that assessment. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, thank you. Um, once uh, I want to a question about the reports of kill zones in Gaza. Uh, you said that you know you haven't seen evidence of such a thing, but you know we've seen, for instance, the two Palestinians who were waving white flags killed just days ago. We've seen repeated reports of. Israeli snipers killing people outside of hospitals, people afraid to even walk into the streets to save people who are bleeding out. Um, so it seems understandable to say, you know, we've seen reports, Israel denied it, we'll look into it. But to outright say there's, there's not evidence of Israel establishing some form of, of this kind of practice, does, does that seem you know, preliminary to, to say that kind of thing? No, we've not seen evidence of, of what, was, what it was reported in this article. Now, have we seen uh, a number of incidents of civilian harm? Of course we have. We have seen those, and that happens in, in every war. Uh, and I can tell you what we have said before, which is we take those incredibly seriously. We have engaged with the government of Israel to set, to make clear that uh, those accounts need to be investigated. And if, if soldiers are found to have operated in violation of either uh, the IDF code of conduct or international humanitarian law, they need to be disciplined. Okay, and then on Al Shifa Hospital, I know you've talked at, at some length about it, but I'm just wondering, you know, we've gone from months ago, the idea of Israeli forces targeting hospitals to being, you know, outlandish to now they've done this um, attack on Al-Shifa and statedly and ostensibly they say that, you know, they've killed um, Hamas terrorists. Nevertheless, you know, we've seen reports of kids, women found gruesomely killed, executed, reportedly even a surgeon who was there for 172, 172 days, excuse me, treating patients killed. Um, and, you know, some victims, we can't even confirm their, their identity because of the, the state of their bodies. So I'm wondering, you know, given this attack, given the evident lack of care for civilians, given that we can't get an update on investigations into, for instance, the now two-month killing of Hind, um, the medic sent to save her, how can the U.S. approve, you know, any action in Tarafa, a slice of land where, you know, 1.1 million Palestinians are seeking refuge? If, if, if a targeted attack on a hospital looks yeah. like this, what would an attack so, in any form on Rafa look like? Uh, again, <clears throat> do not believe that this attack was on the hospital. It, the attack was on the Hamas fighters that are hiding inside a hospital. Sure, but that's, that's sort of my some, point. Some place that they should never be. But it makes you make a good point with respect to Rafa, which is why we have made clear we don't want to see a full-scale military operation. But I think the 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 premise of the question I, I shouldn't say I shouldn't say the premise of the question because I don't want to attribute this to you. But the other alternative is that Israel does nothing about the Hamas fighters that continue to exist uh, in Rafa. And we don't think that's an acceptable alternative either. So what we have said is there needs to be a targeted military operation in Rafa that targets the Hamas fighters in a way that minimizes civilian harm uh, and not a full-scale uh, operation. That's been what, we've, what we have been making clear to them. Just one small follow-up on that, uh, if you'll allow. Um, I guess this just gets to a broader question about, you know, where, what does the U.S. see as sort of the path out of here? Like, is it political? Because what does it mean for Israel to defend itself ongoingly? Like, is it a matter of eradicating everyone who is associated with Hamas? Because that, I don't know, yeah. doesn't necessarily seem like a goal that has led to the protection of civilians up to this point. So there, needs, they have, there need to be battlefield successes, and there needs to be a political path forward. And that is what we have been engaged with partners in the region uh, to develop and ultimately to present to Israel. Because as you have heard the Secretary say, Without a political path forward for the Palestinian people, Israel and the Palestinians are going to be stuck in this same cycle of violence that they have been stuck in for decades. And that's not in the Palestinian people's interest, as we have seen over the past nearly six months. It is not in Israel's interest, as we saw very clearly on October 7th. And so 
that is the work that we are doing inside the United States government to try to develop that political path forward that we think is ultimately is in the best interests of the Palestinian people, the Israeli people, and the broader uh, region at large. Uh, yesterday, Turkey held local elections. I know it's the local elections, but it has a significant outcome. So do you have any comment or statement about these elections, the process of these elections or the results? Uh, I don't have any, any comment on that. We typically don't um, uh, comment or take a position on elections anywhere in the world. And the uh, elections are over. Do you have any updates about President Erdogan's uh, visit to Washington? In uh, I do not. Uh, go ahead, and then we'll wrap for this. Uh, come to Gita. Good news about uh, one of the U.S. detainee in Afghanistan, uh, Mr. Ryan Conward. I spoke to the uh, senior Taliban official. They said that he's in good health and he speaks to his family. Uh, Another detainee before him was Joshua Boyce, who also contacted me after he was released from the Taliban. I requested the Taliban that these detainees should be released immediately without any conditions in the holy month of Ramadan. They said, we will definitely do it if you give us commitment that uh, the U.S. will release our detainees. And I uh, am not a media group so big as Al Jazeera. I'm just a small-time niche media group. Is there anything... I can convey that like these detainees should be I mean, given back to each other or it's too much out of my... I, I, with all due respect, I think I will decline to conduct diplomacy okay, uh, that's what you I, th through this podium. That's what I... Uh, but I will say two things. One, we are concerned, despite those assurances, well-meaning as they may be, we are concerned about the well-being of Americans detained in Afghanistan. And number two, we are actively working for their release and we'll continue Thank you. to do that. Uh, my second question is, uh, drones have been reported flying in different parts of Afghanistan. Anything uh, you can share that at least? Uh, no, no. No. I don't have any last, on last, get, last, get, last, get, last, Gita, one more. Out of five, was, six Gita, questions, Gita, I don't even get I, three. And Gita, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Human Rights Watch has uh, issued a report on the situation of the Baha'is in Iran. It says that the Iranians' persecution of this uh, religious minority is tantamount to crimes against humanity. I was wondering, since the State Department has been following their situation, the situation of the, the Baha'is in Iran, if you would have the same assessment as Human Rights Watch? Uh, let me take that back and, and get you an assessment. I haven't seen that. That Obviously, it's an issue we've been following. I haven't seen that specific report, but let me talk to others in the building who might have and, and get your response. Thank with you. that, we'll wrap for today. Thanks, everyone.